few weeks ago I was approached by McKeeper about a painting that they thought was mine. There's another Peter Wood in this world, in fact there are many, but there's one that churns out a whole conveyor belt line of works that are very like Bob Ross's commercial, uh, just textured, very easy to do, but pleasant scenes, and people seem to like them, and he sells them quite well. Thank you for been selling more than I am. Anyway, by the by, I've been sent these over the past 20 years and even been offered his palette in the past, let alone his, his old paints and things. Do I want to buy them back, buy the painting back, how much is it worth? Very difficult for me to answer without offending anybody either because the paintings are commercial and the gallery and an art dealer wouldn't, wouldn't touch them. I've made a collection of them and sent them back to people who ask me about them and give, a, and give the best advice I can for them. And to simply say, look at my website and you'll see they're nothing like mine. In this case, they sent me one saying, we're going to auction this, what do you think it's worth? And I said, well, um, you know, about £30 at auction, if that. But what I did do then, having, having perhaps disappointed them, was donated a painting of mine to them, this one of um, Beverly Minster, and said, you can have this to auction by all means. And then we took it a stage further by saying, well, why don't I come and do you a demonstration, and we'll donate all of the demonstration money um, towards your foundation to aid these uh, children in Africa, which is what Mapika is about. It may be that I even go and help them film there later to promote them. So this film that I'm doing now is about that uh, demonstration I'm going to do of a Dale scene hopefully using rollers and brushes and so on, and using a team that's local to their area, where they're established and where they have their centres. brushes or whatever, make a mixture of all the interior polyfill and PVA glue so it has more adhesion, it's more plastic, and you can build up your surface onto this um, with those very quickly. Then I prime the black in this case, and then I work my paint over the top of that, which makes it look as if it's very thick paint, and it gives you a lovely texturing to work with, but actually it's quite simple. While I'm on the subject of SAA, how many members have we got, SAA members have we got in here? There's a few, isn't there? Well done. If you're not an SAA member, it used to be um, the Society of Amateur Artists, now they call themselves the Society of All Artists, they didn't like that. <laughs> and I've been a for many years. Um, there are some free literature at the back there. Um, there's magazines, there's their price list, there's their application forms to join. If you're not a member, it's worth considering because if you're exhibiting anywhere, you get free insurance. You just list your paintings, you, put, you send it into the SAA, and you're automatically covered. If you're an all member as I am, you're automatically insured for teaching and so on. Uh, the materials are much cheaper from there as well. And Richard Hope Hawkins, lovely fellow, um, he's guaranteed to me, because I said to my students the same, that any materials you buy from them, if you can find them cheaper somewhere else afterwards, they'll leave under the difference. So they've got to be the cheapest, haven't they, really? So they're worth considering anyway. The details are there, so consider them. They've got a good online website as well. Um, and they also, you know, obviously they've got the local members now here. So it tells you about the difficulties of travelling with paints. I mean, for instance, when I went to America once, um, British Airways were quite happy to allow um, oil paints through, and then I got halfway, and, and um, the American Airways wouldn't. You wouldn't be so careful what you actually take. Airways will allow you to take an aerosol can of um, hairspray, but not fix it. But you can fix with hairspray anyway. So, but you know, just be careful if you're travelling abroad, just what you take, how you take it. To acrylics, yes, oils, no, anything flammable, but you know, you've got to check, check your walls and red. Well, the little tips I give today, by all means ask questions all the way through. That's what I'm here for. I've also got my watercolor brushes here, because there's a lot of brushes you may not even have seen. Now, if you're a fisherman, you know fishermen have about 200 floats, but they've got one favorite they use the whole time. It's very usual, but it's a collection. We tend to, some people do that with brushes, you hundreds of brushes, but actually all of these brushes in here have a purpose. And yet, when I'm using my acrylics or oils, all I need is a couple of sets like that. Now I tend to use filberts, these ones, filberts are the flat rounded end ones, yeah? 
and I use a certain consistency. You do come to feel these brushes later. A brush that's too soft will clog with the paint. A brush that's too stiff, you can't lay the paint on it, lifts it off, it scrapes through. So hogs hair, forget it. These are medium nylon, and they're just perfect for placing the paint on gently or more. Stay wet palette, another trick for you. you use acrylics, and they go dry on you. If you don't know this, cheap sandwich box, a couple of quid. Make it deep enough, don't get a shallow one. Put in the bottom two layers of paper towel, and then a piece of greaseproof on top, okay? Wet it, your acrylics will stay wet for months. If you've done that already, it's so cheap, that you can buy expensive ones, but all the hours of box are the same, you know, so why not? So I've just put new paints out this morning. I've dampened my sponges ready to go. I don't want to work with a dry sponge. And what I want to do first of all, I have to consider, now, photographs always reach out. When you're doing your photography, you're doing a landscape, take two pictures, take one with the sky in and take one then with the sky out of it, because if you photograph just as a whole normally, this will bleach out to white and the darks become very dark and the whites become very white. They can be too, too big and opposite. So take one of the whole and then take one of mainly the sky. And your metering will then go to the sky. And then take one which is mainly the landscape. And then the metering will be mainly to the landscape. And you'll get the colours better. I've got to say, well, what am I going to do with the sky? It looks white, but it's almost as white as the paper. So I think, well, if I want it warmer than there, I'm going to have to make it, maybe it'll use broken colour. Broken colour means that instead of mixing red and yellow to make orange, I'll put red and yellow dots together. Now I can do that, which is what, the, which is what Monet did, and it fools the eye, it gives them more of a vibrance. So if I put um, a very light yellow onto here, or a light blue and then a cream on top of that, and let me use the sponge rollers, it's going to give me a misty effect, and a more vibrant effect than just one colour. Let's do that straight away. <coughs> That's some fun. Now I've, I've got a dark canvas a little bit so I can leave these darks behind. I'm not the first one doing that, Constable used to do it. We look at Constable studies and he was working out of doors. He was one of the first people to do that. He would have a very deep under background. And he would actually, if you look at some of the closer paintings, you see the tree branches aren't painted at all. He's painted the sky and left the branches behind. behind. Yep. If you look at Constable's paintings now as well, always look at that little red figure. Because in almost every one of Constable's paintings, there's a little red figure. Why? Come on. It's the opposite in the colour circle to the green. Oh. Yep. Um, that's good. Now take a chance. That's what, um, and the opposite, that means we're playing colour. We've got this colour chemistry, which is what I was saying about learning about colours. A little bit of red will bring the greens out. So that one little red figure, it's like, wow, you make the greens work. You know? So um, there's reasons we want to, to choose colours and what we're doing. Okay. And I'm, let's see, what am I going to do? I'm going to start with a very, very light, light blue, I think, on this. I'll put the light turquoise, first of all. And, um, and I'm going to put some yellow over that and make it sort of greeny sky. I'm not too, too big a model yet, let's get it working. Oh. And I've just marked off very loosely. You don't need to do too much detail for work. It's going to paint over it anyway. Um, just, you can see how lovely marks you get with the roll. And I can start to leave my trees behind. And immediately I've got trees, trees coming. So almost straight away I've got my drawing starting. But I'm going to leave some dark showing there. I've got to observe the paint up here as well. If I get in your way too much, do say. I, I went to see, a, when I was in America, I was painting in Appalachian Spring in North Carolina a couple of years ago, and I went to see somebody demo, because I learned, well, we're always learning, we're always, none of us stop learning, do we? In fact, the more we learn, the more we realise we don't know, eh? Mm -hmm. um, and I went to watch this artist, she was very good, but she was like this the whole demonstration. Nobody could see a thing, <laughs> it was a shame, you couldn't be, you know, didn't like to say anything. But, so I'm just leaving a little bit of dark, Showing through here to get my effects. First of all, you can see it's, it's very fast, the techniques. Just gradually build this up. And I can use it light so I can get the textures, and I can mottle the colour on, the, on here. I can use the secret sort of mottled effect here as well. And I can start even down here. Now, when you're painting water, my trick there is 
paint your verticals first. Yeah? Paint the reflections in still water. This is not so much in water like this, but still water. Paint the reflections first. Paint the depth of the water. And afterwards, do the horizontals. Not quite so easy in watercolour, because in watercolour, then you've got to um, use masking fluid and things and dry brushwork. But it will give you much better reflections, lovely water, by doing the depth and the verticals first and then the horizontal purpose. So, just for fun, I'm going to just peel <coughs> the light of the just, just a feeling of it. And I'm going to put them both ways, just to sort of, I mean, already you start to get a feeling of reflection just, just with one coming across another. Uh, it's quite quick. Very loose. Right, another um, thing that I teach is. Um, if you remember this now, I think you'll find it very useful. When you've got a very complicated scene especially, no matter how complicated it is, forget that they're dogs, forget that they're people, forget that they're horses, paint the whole thing in the same way. So, put the right colours in the right shapes, in the right places, relevant one to another, like making a jigsaw. So we're going to make a jigsaw. See, I'm keeping the whole painting going, yeah? All at once. So don't paint one, paint and finish it. The whole thing is going to evolve and, and finish at the same time. That way, you're in control, you can finish whatever you want. And it doesn't matter what it is, because if you're putting the right shapes and right colours in the right places, like a jigsaw, it's going to appear in the end. When I was a student, and I was painting at home, I was doing my parents' garden with some standard roses. The garden looked fantastic, and I came to these roses at the end, and they wouldn't work. I couldn't get them to... They always looked like those, you know, you get these catalogues, and the roses stand out, like, because the photographs are so bright. And I realised what I was doing. I was trying to paint them differently to the rest of the painting. So I then treated them like facets of a jewel. I just painted each colour relevant one to another within that painting, and there the roses appeared. So, you know, and I've said this when I've uh, judged exhibitions and things, you know, quite often people have put a dog and a person in afterwards. It stands out like a sore thumb because they've painted it differently to the rest of the painting. Keep the whole thing similar as a whole. It's much better. It's a nice, easy way to work. It's lovely and loose. So I start loose and I finish tight. If I start tight, I'm stuffed, aren't I? Because you can't go loose again. Um, we should put some more paint in with this with, with, uh, with the knives and things later and brushes as well. Just want to get started. deliberately start to work in some, some colour over this, so I'll show you how we can get this effect of the broken colour. And quite often you don't have to um, clean your palette up. When I'm working from my light colours to my darker colours, it means that I can just mix straight into this for the moment. Let's now put a bit of warmer colour over that to start to make this broken colour effect. Let me build it up. You can see now there's a bit more of a glow there, there's a bit more warmth. Now I'm going to put some cream over that in a minute, so I'm going to put several, several coats of colour. We're actually building this up. Two hours, so I may be working through my lunch break yet. <laughs> right, right now I want to go um, I'm going to put a lot more blue into that because I've now got to do this area in the background for the um, distant hills, so it's a slightly stronger blue. Put a little bit of mode into it. Let's see if that looks as well on my in there again. Let's see if we can get this. Down here. brush, use it. So if it's somewhere else, put it somewhere else.
It's a lovely loose way to work. It's more difficult on a smaller canvas, admittedly. But some of these you can get quite small models. I'm going to say there's that little one there, look, which is good. But putting paint on applying paint can be done in so many ways. You could do it with your fingers, you could, you know, that's what I show when I've got my students who can go through all sorts of different ways of working. Why do you teach? I teach at home, um, just doing my lessons up at the last conservatory. Moving on at the moment, I'm setting up my house and hopefully buying another place not too far away near to Grimsby. Already you can start to see the light coming. Right, I want to go back to my cream, so I'm going to wash my roller now. I've borrowed a kitchen utensil here from the kitchen. Now, in every colour, there is a hue. Hue is not the guy sitting next to you, it <laughs> is warms and cools. So, in yellow, Lemon yellow would be a cool, it's bluer. Yellow ochre would be a warm hue. In reds, cadmium red would be a warm hue, and rose would be a cool. In greens, your sap green is going to be warmer, your green and cooler, and so on. So, here I'm going to start off with what I want. I want a fairly, um, I want a fairly cool yellow on this one, so I'm going to use some lemon yellow. On this, just to give a very light, and too dark that, a little bit lighter. Let's see if this is not too dark now. I'm just going to go over the sky now. I was talking about broken colour. I'm going to go over the sky, just find it a little bit more light. Coming out and that's just, that's better. Coming through, blowing through. Now that brings that blue out more. Get the effect of light there. And one colour can glow through another. I want this late summer feeling of mid-morning light. And that can just come through here a little bit. So you can almost glaze it, can't you? It's almost like dry brush work. We can go as hard as we can press it harder, you can make it, if you want to make it harder. But just bring up this effect of light through the background. We can have some of the water just starting to reflect. Now I'm painting very close up. I'm a bit like a sword fence, so normally I would be working out with the long brushes, seeing what I'm doing from a distance. In this case I can't quite do that. Start doing um, some of the textures. I'm going to start getting these colours in here. Let's start working deeper colours now. Then, wash my. when a student comes to me and says, oh, I've got this wrong and I've got that wrong. No, it isn't that. It's something next to it. As an example, I was painting a picture of Goodnight from Harbour at sunrise, and I made the same mistake. I was trying to get things warmer and warmer, brighter and brighter, more and more orange, more and more yellows. This wouldn't work. Idiot. The opposite way. Rough against smooth, light against dark, warm against cool. I wanted it warmer, so put cool next to it. I was trying to get too many oranges, I should have gone back to the blues and made it cooler to make those work. So when you think something is wrong, it's not always the thing you think it is, it could be something next to it. And very much 90% of the time it usually is. Right, let's go back to our warmer colours now. Let's start. Now 
Now, I don't normally use black. I have used black in these more designer ones, but normally all of my darks are made with um, Prussian blue and brown. Grays, uh, the easiest way to make a gray is a tertiary and secondary, so tertiary and primary, is brown and um, blue. Any, you know, you've got all these various blues, haven't you, and all these various browns. When you go home sometime, take some white and your different browns and blues, and see how many greys you can make. That way you can go warm grey or cool grey. You've got the choice. Yeah? So don't use black, greys, and blue browns. And for those of you who love the working watercolour, for those of you who use oils or acrylics, try mixing alizarin crimson with meridian green sometime. You would never think of mixing those two, because they're like Prussian, they're so horrible, aren't they? Meridian green is acid. And, and, and the lizard crimson is lethal. But put the two together and it makes with white the most beautiful soft grey. You can go to a greeny grey or a warm grey that way. And for skies, it can't make that difference on a certain sky when you want the colours to be reflecting the, the landscape. So you've got your greys from blues and browns and you've got your lizard crimson and viridian green to try now. It doesn't work in most colour that one, okay? Add a little bit more of that and more of this. That. So lots of tips for you. Right, let's start to get some colour. Now, I'm using this quite thinly, so that the, the, um, at the moment my sponge is quite wet. And we want to start getting some warms going. So it's going on quite thinly at the moment. Working on a dark ground does mean that things are going to sink a little bit. You know, if I want to work up in more detail, I'll do that later. But I'll just work more and more and more into it until I get the effects I want. Now, sea sponges, art shops sell them. You can get them very reasonably from the SAA and so on. But also, they're very cheap on, on eBay. Now, isn't it Google? Google and eBay, aren't they just so wonderful? I mean, anything you want to know, you just type into Google and it comes up. You know, battery for your camera, what to get. It's amazing. It, the most obscure things are there. It's just uh, so wonderful. And eBay is great to buy almost anything you put in. You know, you want a, 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 an ear picker or a nose trimmer or whatever. It's always there. Uh, <laughs> So yes, you can shop around, even seaside shops sometimes have cheap bags of sea sponges. Um, right, I'm going to change now, I want to do my uh, greens, I'm going to start doing some texturing with the sponges. So yes, you can, you can source cheaper places for things quite often, like sponges and things. Now, Again, I want to start with background colours, so I'm going to work from my deepest colours forward. I tend to do that when I'm doing oil painting. I start from my mid-tones, then I go down to my deeper colours and work out. I'm painting with light. This isn't paint, it's light for me. And it's beautiful, because whenever I put a colour on, I'm now painting light. So I'm going to get these bits of light that are reflecting on the leaves. I'm going to gradually work those up. We'll start with a fairly deep, um, deep green. In the background there, 
I may do a bit deeper than that actually at the minute. I'll just go just get that started off. Now that's a nice sea sponge, so choose them carefully. Texture, whatever texture you want, you can get them from fine right up to quite heavy textures. Let's um, just now don't make a pattern. If I go like that, it's going to make her a pattern. Each time you use your sponge, turn it. So twist and turn. If I drag the sponge, I can make um, reflective marks as well. I can make longer marks like grasses and things. So I don't just have to use my sponge. Just tap it on um, and twist as you go. Not, not your body, no, but... <laughs> Here. Right up through. Now, so I'm building up my slightly deeper tones at the moment. That camera on there. There we go. I haven't finished with the roller yet. I've got a bit more work to do with the rollers yet. Now we go lighter still. We'll take some of the yellow, lemon yellow this time again, the cool yellow, because I'm going to go warmer later. I tend to, one phrase I tend to keep using in my videos, I've got to be careful because I, I realise I'm using stock phrases, but lighter later is something I keep saying. I'm going to do lighter later, lighter later. <laughs> Look at this lovely colour we're getting now. Look. So start getting the sunlight, yeah? We can just build up with these textures and tones. Shut up there, get up there, that's it. And I can drag it slightly to make slightly larger leaves here, look, just pull it across. Painting should be fun. I know there's usually a stage where you want to chuck it over your shoulder, and it has been known. I destroyed a canvas in Scotland once. I was getting eaten by mosquitoes. The wind blew it off, and things weren't going right. And it, I then went like a frisbee across the, and it hit a rock. But you know, normally I hold my temper. But for all of us, it's the same. You've got to work through that stage. You know, there's always going to be a time when you're really struggling, but you need to work through it. Something like that. <laughs> no, you've just got to get on with it. And Sometimes a painting needs to be really pushed as well. You've got to do something quite different. It's just not working. You think, well, put, make the colour stronger or you've got to really, really take a chance on something. Um, right, now I'm going to go to a warmer yellow. Okay, let's go warmer still. It's amazing how you just the, the light comes, doesn't it? I'm painting with light, that's right. Now, we'll start, well, deliberately now, we're going to go warmer still. I'm going to go to my um, brown, my yellow, uh, my um, burnt siennas and so on. Let's wash this off a bit. I'm going to need clean palette again. What time did you want lunch, by the way? How long have I got? One o'clock. Okay, so I've got another 20 minutes or so. Fine. Just so long as my timing is right. Right, so we'll start getting some... Now, yellow oak is a lovely colour. Now, watercolourists... How many watercolours have we got here? That's less than I expected. You know, normally it's... Uh, I, know, I know you. But, but there's normally uh, you know, more watercolours than there is... Um, <laughs> both. Multi... That's right, multi... Great. Um... And I forgot what I was going to say now. Uh, I'll have a think about that in a minute. Um, oh yes, transparent colours. Um, Hazel Sowen, love Hazel Sowen's work. You know Hazel Sowen's work. Um, but she put me on to Oriolin Yellow a while ago. Um, you want to use in watercolour as much as possible uh, transparent rather than opaque colours. So um, the yellow ochre is uh, opaque, whereas um, raw sienna is transparent. So raw sienna is nicer. 
lemon yellow is opaque and rather dead, but Oriolan yellow is beautiful. If you've never used it, try it. Another color to get, cobalt violet. Beautiful light pink. You can't get away without the rose and the cobalt violet. I was trying to paint azaleas in, in Savannah about 20 years ago now, and I only had with me alizarin crimson and cadmium red, and I just couldn't do it. You needed the rose. You know, there are certain colors that you cannot mix, you must have. Magenta is one of them. Magenta is a superb color. You can't mix a purple. You have to have a bought purple, but with magenta you can get a reasonable purple. Magenta and cerulean blue, for instance, give you a reasonable one. But you can't do it with the other reds, it turns brown. So, you know, certain colours we need to know about. But, you know, I'm on the email. Like I say, it's all on the website, and if anybody has a question later, can't do it all today, email me, have a chat. Right, let's go down now to some warmer colours. Let's start to get... I haven't even used the brush yet. Wait till I get going with the brush, I'm mad. Let's start to see some of the, oops, a little bit too bright that, a little bit more brown into there, a little wee touch of purple into there, let's bring it down a bit, there we go, try that one, that's better, yep, we'll just start to get some of these autumn leaves coming down, going on through here in the background. Right, so almost finished with my sponge, I want to go back now with the roller and just touch a few bits up here and there, um, but I may a bit more of the brushes. Now they said the colours will sink a little bit so as I'm building this up you can see now lighter and lighter and as I put lighter the dark has become darker so cool against warm, rough against smooth, light against dark. We're playing all of these effects. No, um, watercolours at various angles yes. But, uh, well, having said that, there will be times, I mean, when I, when I did the spraying on that, yeah, because you need to be spraying downward onto it rather than with the dishes and things on. But normally I've got, I need to get back from my work, as I am here, I need to get back from it to see it. Um, um, well, the SAA do their own range of acrylics, which are quite nice. Um, very cheap acrylics are very thin. And I think in any acrylic, I've yet to find, with the most expensive one even, a really good yellow. The yellows especially tend to be very, very thin. So white is what we call a body colour. White adds thickness to it. So most of the yellows, you've got to add a little bit of white or to, to a thinner colour to make them work. For what, for canvases? For canvases. Uh, you can get cheap, I, I just use cheap canvases, nobody's prepared to pay for my paintings, so I'm not going to give them expensive canvases. No, I, mean, I, I, I get them from, from all sorts of um, uh, littles and all sorts of places, you know. Just to, but if you get a cheap canvas, um, the wood is cheaper on the back. Obviously, some people don't like to pay for framing, so the, the deep canvases are nice for that. You can paint the edges, you don't have to frame them, they're nice to work on. There is that. So those deep ones are nice, but they're more expensive. But if you get a cheap canvas, do prime it a couple of times more. Put a couple of coats of emulsion on. Or think about what I've done, putting a coat of acrylic on here. Um, oh, I bought the canvas, I painted it with acrylic. Yeah, so as, as consequent, I, I would have a different colour for my background. I mean, that, that one was painted with a dark ground as well, as that one was. You see, that's a dark ground, and I've simply put the, the bricks on top. So they're just showing through, as, as Constable did. Um, but yeah, a, cheap, a more expensive canvas is heavier, it will last longer, the wood's better, it doesn't warp, and the, the surface is nicer. But if you're getting a cheap one, give it a couple of coats of emulsion, and it'll have a much nicer surface. They're very dry otherwise. And it starts to make the cools cooler. I mean, actually, it might be better with a pink rather than a... Yeah, I'm going to... As you go along, it's just, a lot of it's intuition, isn't it? Um, let's, do, let's do more of a pink there. Coming up through there. And that gives more sunlight coming through the sky. Only a few marks, but you can, you can work in it. I could go back and make it cooler again. You can move backwards and forwards. Just lightly, just tip of my fingers, and the same with the brush. Brush skills are very important, you know, how you hold the brush and how you place the brush on. And so now we've made a bit more sunshine in it. Now I've got that on there. I'm going to bring it through here a little bit more. I'll just bring out these trees a bit with this. Well, I've got it on, bit of sunlight down the trees. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, back to my brush. Now you don't want to be fixed in stone with anything. You need to be able to change whatever you want when you want. Right, I've used a big brush for the moment just for mixing, but I'm going to now go down in size a bit. Yeah. Right. Now watercolour brushes, if your watercolour brushes get bent or they're out of, um, you know, bo put them in boiling water, literally boil them for a while and it softens them right down then reshape them and they'll dry back into, it almost renews them, okay? But yes, ordinary paint solvent on nylon brushes like that and you can bring them back quite well. Don't leave your brushes stuck in water or in turps two things happen. It softens the glue around the ferrule and it expands the wood so the ferrules can actually break. Uh, not, not, not good news. Okay, now if I want to start painting leaves, so um, leaves I think are a bit like, trees are like explosions, uh, atomic explosions. Acorn hits the ground, grows up, comes out into the branches, forms a parasols, comes down, drops in autumn. Yeah. So when I do my leaves now, I want to um, start exploding these outwards with a brush. I'm going to use it sideways, and I'm going to just start to bring out these, these leaves. Exploding, cascading down, a bit like a waterfall. One colour over another, getting lighter and lighter, gradually lighter and lighter. Light against dark, warm against cool, rough against smooth. So I'm going to have to go for a few darker leaves up here in a minute to show. Go to a darker colour, I'll take some of my Prussian blue and we'll bring a few darker shapes of leaves through here. So one thing against another, light against dark and you see the, the effect? Yeah. We're constantly playing counter tone and counter colour. Right. Different brushes for different jobs. Let's move to a rigger if I can find one. There we go. When you're using your brushes, try and mix with a stronger, heavier brush. Don't mix with your fine brushes. So if I'm going to use a rigger, I'm not going to use that to mix with because I'd ruin it. Um, but I will mix with a go across to here now. A bit of Prussian blue and some a little bit of black. I'm going to use black this time because I've already got black on my... And we should be able to start getting some branches in. Just flow with it, just flow. Remember branches grow, always grow from thick to thin. How many times have I seen people going thick, thin, thick? Unless there's a burr in the tree. A burr is... Um, where there's a cancer in the tree and then it will grow larger and that's where you get those wonderful um, veneers and things for uh, marquetry because they come from the burrs of the tree. And then I will go over this again because some of these darks that I'm putting in now have leaves coming across them so I'm going to have several layers aren't I? And don't forget that your paint is drying all of the time, even in the palette, so you've got to keep adding water. When you're mixing watercolours, don't do that. When you're doing watercolour in a wash, don't keep going back to your water and then going back to your wash. Every time you do that, you're diluting it. So, but with, with oils and acrylics, quite different. You, you need to keep that wet. Twelve. Um, I did a picture... If you go to my website, you can actually see my paintings from the age of ten right through to today. I've kept a whole record. So you can see my first oil painting at about 12 years old when I did a little, um, couple of flowers in a vase or something, um, up to 15 to college and right the way through. So you might, you might find it quite interesting. Um, they didn't, I went to a boarding school at the age of 10. So when I was at primary, somebody said, oh yes, he's quite talented, he's quite good. And then nothing happened because they didn't do art at the boarding school until I was 15. And then I left and went to College of FE to do art and so on. And my father, on June the 6th, a few days ago, some lady said, I've got that, come on. <laughs> Be nice. Actually, I should have planted people in our vision. 
take the first for the second half. To just give it this point. Just give it this point. Yeah. The kettle is on. Right. So if you'd like to. Uh, we want a cuppa. I'm just going to carry on tickling. Yep. Uh, Come and ask questions. Come and take a look at the brushes. Look at my stuff. Look at the paints. Look at anything. The videos. Ask me what you want. Wander about. <laughs> That's halfway. <laughs> We're only halfway. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Yeah. I think you waste a lot of the, the paint because yeah. Well, I mean you do, but I mean they expensive the Not that bad. No. But I mean they go a long way, and, and they say keep them this way; they'll last as well. So it's no good putting little bits out. The amateurs just put that much. You can't. If you're going to paint loosely. You need to have plenty of paint. Right. I'm going to move to a painting knife now. Now there's a difference. There's a big difference between a painting knife and a palette knife. I get a little bit irritated on this. I don't know why, but I've got a phobia about it. But a palette knife is that. And you can see the difference. That's straight, and that's got an angle like a cement trowel. This is a painting knife because my fingers don't touch the canvas. That's a palette knife for cleaning the palette because it's straight, it's flat. Two different things, painting knife, palette knife, yeah? Even the experts don't do it. Um, so you don't really need one of those. Uh, and your fingers don't touch anything, yeah? You can get them quite cheaply. Again, that main set came from Liddles years ago. Um, for about five, it was about five or six palette, uh, painting knives for about um, four quid or something silly, you know, even in the case. You don't have to spend lots of money to get some of these things. And different shapes. This one actually is a Bob Ross one. Um, it's one of my favourites, but I like that particular shape because it's so versatile. But you've got long ones, little ones, you know, little triangle, all sorts you can build up. And you'll find different uses for them. Um, if you want to use an edge, then you can make a, a line along something. Or you can use them downwards to scrape. And get the effect of across down. You see dry brushing almost across. Quite effective. It would be easier if I had a flat palette now, but this palette is so, so knackered. It's, uh, I'm just going to sort of put the lights in. I'm going to put my mid-tones in first and gradually work on doing some vertical marks and some horizontal to try and get the feeling of the water. See what's coming to life straight away? Yeah. Right down to here. Start to put the foam in. We can we can just we can twist it and put some foam in coming down here. Look, good fun, isn't it? Yeah, different techniques you're seeing. So you've seen sponge roller, you've seen sponge, you've seen brush, and now I'm working on the painting knife. whatever I can get. <laughs> um, without a gallery on my own, my price is a uh, watercolour light. I think I've got the price on that one, haven't I? Legs are going now. Um, yeah, that, that's up at 120. So I don't think that's expensive for a mounted watercolour. That, that's an original as well. Um, so yeah, on an average, about 120 for a 80 to 120 for a mounted watercolor or pastel, about 160, 180 for a frame because you've got to add 60 quid on or so. Um, big ones like these, I mean that one I, I've got up at about 450, I think, um, which I don't think is too high for that even without a frame because it's you know it, that one would go at about 280. So I'm, I'm not on the huge. I think I'm, I'm reasonably priced for what I'm doing. So we can drag it across and make um, more textural work of it. We can... Now a little bit more cream. Do you mean painting knife, sir? Paint, sorry, yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> it gives you, I mean, you could paint, um, paint on gently with a, a brush like that and slab it. But what it's giving me is um, the, the way of putting on, like, I always think of oil paint, there's not so much of this stuff, but oil paint is a bit like strawberries and cream. You know, if you can imagine put, taking one of these and putting cream on strawberries, that slabbing effect, yeah, which you, it's difficult to get with a brush. You, you can delicately paint on with a brush, but if I want to get these, a slab of colour like that just there, look, I mean, I can just take that in and just go like that. And, it, and it's instantly putting a bit of cream in now to play the warms against the cools. So now I'm going to put a bit of that cream across here deliberately and start playing these warmer lights against the... And immediately the other colours are changed by the one next to it. So that's why I've got that colour video, because it's, it's vital that you understand about colours. I know it's technical, but... Um, <sighs> Sorry? Oh yes, this is one of my favourite spots. You know Apple Tree Wick and Bolton Abbey? No, Bolton Abbey. Yeah, well just up from Bolton Abbey, Apple Tree Wick, on the way to... which bridge is it? Burnsell Bridge, yeah, which I've painted many times. And in between Burnsell, sorry, in between Bolton Abbey and Apple Tree Wick is the little road going along the back there. Just down the side is this little stream. Um, and in fact, when I was there, there were some mandarin ducks that were that were actually breeding there. And I, I put that in afterwards. I was going to put it in this one, but your leader said, no, don't have the duck. So I didn't put the duck in, but you could have had it. No, what I would have done was painted the duck beforehand, you see, so it would just be there to paint around, because I wouldn't have had the time to do it today. But I did a demo for... But I'm going to finish in a minute, because I think... I don't want to overdo this one. I think it's just nice and fresh as it is. It's just a nice, lively, lively nice painting. No, lively and loose painting. Um, we'll have a little bit more light just coming through here. You can go back in the end and put light back in again. Look. That's one of the things about acrylics. You remember you're working over, you can put light over dark or dark over light. You're not stuck, as with watercolour. It's hard to go back again. But here, I can go back again and put my colours in. So I'll bring this green down here to give more coherence through the whole thing. Right, I'm going to finish at that, OK? Give an idea. And what I'll, I'll just use this now. Signature again, back to a round brush. You've got signatures are so important. People forget, they think, you know, the, the, the painting is done. The signature is a part of the painting. The colour you choose and where you put that signature is vital. And you can be very flashy with the signatures. Now, I'm happy enough to have a signature here, but what colour am I going to do it in? What will balance? Um, shall I do it in the same colour as the water? Shall I do it in a green? Shall I do it in a warm? I'm going to choose deliberately... Um, what am I going to choose deliberately? So I think, what am I going to use here? Um, I'm going to sign it with a warm, because I'm going to do it like the leaves here, and just bring that bit forward a bit. So let's see what happens. And that should just give me a bit more foreground to it. Just leading the eye in a bit more, yeah? Even the colour use, one small mark makes such a difference, yeah? Sometimes I've even changed the colours I've gone across the signature, deliberately. I mean, I'll, do, I'll do that now, just for fun. What I'm going to do is just put the two O's on the wood into green, just for fun. We'll just see what happens. This is, this is totally, you know, just to show you. But even that can make a difference. It's a small bit of paint. It's so stupid, isn't it? But it makes a difference to the whole painting. Now it links through. Yeah. So you haven't finished when you finish the painting. There you go. If you want me back, give me a shout, and I'll come back in a minute. <laughs> What's the... Uh, Sorry. Do we start on... When, when are you auctioning? And oh, we're auctioning at afternoons. Oh, we're birthday. To match up the old colours. Instant, instant. Instantly. 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 Thank you.
Kelly. So to man at the time, shall we? Well, yeah, you could have yeah. What about sagitation then? Because that's what we offered. And I'm sure that person would have. So is there any other house on eight pounds? This beautiful painting. I mean, just beat it out of the canvas. Just beat it. You know, before you'd even had a cup of tea, you just beat it. So, be carefully. Chance to, to have it all beautiful and beautiful work. So, to the mystery person, thank you. A few weeks ago I was approached by McKeeper about a painting that they thought was mine. There was another Peter Wood in this world, in fact there are many, but there's one that churns out a whole conveyor belt line of works that are very like Bob Ross's commercial and just textured, very easy to do, but pleasant scenes and people seem to like them and he sells them quite well. I wonder if he's selling more than I am. Anyway, by the by, I've been sent these over the past 20 years and even been offered his palette in the past, let alone his, his old paints and things. Do I want to buy them back, buy the painting back, how much is it worth? very difficult for me to answer without offending anybody either because the paintings are commercial and the gallery and only one art dealer wouldn't, wouldn't touch them. I've made a collection of them and sent them back to people to ask me about them and give, a, and give the best advice I can for them and to simply say look at my website and you'll see they're nothing like mine. In this case they sent me one saying we're going to auction this what do you think it's worth and I said well um, you know about 30 pounds at auction if that but what I did do then having, having perhaps disappointed them was donated a painting of mine to them, this one of um, Beverly Minster, and said you can have this to auction by all means. And then we took it a stage further by saying, well, why don't I come and do you a demonstration, and we'll donate all of the demonstration money um, towards your foundation to aid these uh, children in Africa, which is what Mapika is about. It may be that I even go and help them film there later to promote them. So this film that I'm doing now is about that uh, demonstration I'm going to do of a Dale scene hopefully using rollers and brushes and so on, and using a team that's local to their area where they're established and where they have their centres.